Hello, and welcome to the Electrolyte Club. My name is Halbert Rondon, and I am a nephrologist at the University of Pittsburgh. This is lecture number one, Basic Physiology of Sodium and Extracellular Fluid Volume Homeostasis. The learning objectives for this lecture are, number one, to explain how changes in total body sodium affect extracellular fluid volume. Number two, to describe the clinical manifestations of total body sodium deficit and excess. Number three, to describe the homeostatic response to total body sodium deficit and excess. And number four, list three pathophysiological mechanisms causing decreased effective arterial blood volume. We all have certain amount of sodium in our bodies, certain mass of sodium. I'm going to represent that as sodium E, total body sodium, and the amount of sodium in our bodies is approximately 0.91 grams per kilogram. So for a 70 kilogram man, that will represent about 64 grams of sodium, approximately. Let's say that uh, this man has systolic dysfunction with an ejection fraction of 30% and he goes into a high sodium diet, 6 grams of sodium per day. At the end of 4 days, this man is going to gain about 4.5 grams of sodium. And now his total body sodium will increase from 64 grams to 68 and a half grams. So the question is, what would be the clinical manifestations that you would see in this person that has gained total body sodium? Yes, he can have dyspnea, he can have elevated jugular venous pressure, he could have lung crackles, and perhaps peripheral edema. These are all symptoms and signs of expansion of the extracellular fluid volume, also known as hypervolemia. But why is that? Why is that when you gain sodium, when your total body sodium goes up, your volume of your extracellular fluid goes up as well? Well, you probably heard the phrase, water follows sodium. And that's the reason, it's correct. But let's look at this into more detail and see what happens. So when this patient is gonna go into a high sodium diet, six grams of sodium per day, uh, we're representing uh, this in, in this table here. And if we look at the first row, at day zero, this is before the high sodium diet starts, uh, you see that the initial total body sodium is 64 grams. The sodium intake is, before the diet starts, is going to be about 3.5 grams of sodium per day. And why 3.5? Because that's the average uh, sodium intake in the United States. So now, the kidneys are always trying to maintain homeostasis, equilibrium. And in order for the kidneys to maintain sodium homeostasis or sodium balance, they have to match rates of sodium intake with rates of sodium excretion. So there is no gain or loss of sodium in the body. So the kidneys are excreting the same amount, 3.5 grams of sodium. In that way, there is no net sodium gain or loss, it's zero, and the final sodium at the end of the day is the same, it's 64 grams. So that's when the kidneys are doing homeostasis and the patient is in sodium balance. Now, if we look at the second row, row, at day number one, now the patient starts the high sodium diet, six grams of sodium per day. Now, the kidneys are gonna try to maintain sodium balance and try to match rates of sodium intake with sodium excretion. However, it doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen right away. It takes about three to five days for the kidneys to match the rates of sodium intake with sodium excretion and go back into balance. So the first day of the diet, you see that the kidneys are still excreting three and a half grams. So they are way behind because they haven't had enough time to, to do the uh, adaptation process. So at the end of the day, 
this person is going to gain two and a half grams of sodium and the final sodium would be 66.5 grams now higher than before day number two you start at 66.5 grams of sodium you're still eating the six gram sodium diet your kidneys are start to uh, increase the sodium excretion in an attempt to match sodium intake so now they are up to four and a half grams but at the end of the day this person is going to gain 1.5 grams of sodium uh, and his total body sodium is going to be higher it's going to be now 68 grams day number three again you start at 68 grams you're eating six grams of sodium your kidneys are still increasing the amount of sodium in an attempt to match intake so they are up to 5.5 grams of sodium excretion per day and uh, you still gaining half, an, half a gram of sodium that day and your total body sodium goes up to 68.5 finally at day number four the kidneys are able to match the intake of sodium of 6 grams and they are now excreting 6 grams of sodium and that day you don't gain any sodium but uh, at the end of the day you end up with 68.5 and that's when you the, the body goes back into sodium balance as well. However, if you look at the uh, the time course over the four days of this high sodium diet, this person has gained four and a half grams of sodium, and his total body sodium has increased from 64 to 68.5 grams. So let's look at the inferior portion of the screen. The box on the left represents total body sodium, and the box on the right represents total body water. Now, total body sodium and total body water should maintain a normal ratio or proportion, which is represented here by the two boxes having the same height. That normal ratio or proportion is 140 milliequivalents of total body sodium for every liter of total body water. Now, does that sound familiar? Sure, that is a normal plasma sodium concentration. Exactly. So, as we're going to see in subsequent videos, the ratio between total body sodium and total body water determines the plasma sodium concentration and therefore the plasma osmolality and the plasma tonicity. So this person who has gained four and a half grams after going through high sodium diet, after those four days now the total body sodium is going to be higher than the total body water. So total body water remains the same, total body sodium is much higher now since he has gained total body sodium. That's going to change the normal ratio of 140 milliequivalents of sodium per liter of water and therefore the sodium concentration in the plasma will go up the sodium uh, the plasma osmolality will go up and the plasma tonicity will go up that the body doesn't like so what does the body is going to do it's going to try to match again total body sodium with total body water to maintain the same normal proportion and your body is going to start to retain water okay that blue area there and at the end of the adaptation process the total body sodium will be high but the total body water will be also high because the water the body has retained water so you are going to go back to normal sodium uh, plasma concentration normal osmolarity normal tonicity but at the expense of having been gained this blue area here which is salt and water which is basically isotonic fluid or isotonic volume that the body has gained. So this, if you gain isotonic fluid, you're going to expand your extracellular fluid volume. So when your total body sodium goes up, the consequence of that is that the extracellular fluid volume will increase as well. Now let's look at the opposite scenario when you go on a low when you go on a low sodium diet. Now, low sodium diets depending on which society do you uh, do you listen, you know, if you look at the uh, uh, JNC7, uh, it's 2.4 grams of sodium, that's considered, or less, that's low sodium diet. If you look at uh, American Heart um, Association, uh, they recommend 1.5 grams of sodium. So we're going to assume that, that low, low sodium diet is going to be 1.5 grams of sodium per day. So again, if we look at the table, uh, we look at day zero. This is uh, before the low sodium diet has started. This person starting again at 64 grams at baseline and it's in sodium balance. He's eating 3.5 grams of sodium and his kidneys are excreting 3.5 grams of sodium. So this 
person is in sodium balance. Now, the person in the next row is going to start the low sodium diet. So, he started at 64 grams of total body sodium. Now, he's going to start eating one and a half grams of sodium per day. Now, the kidneys are going to try to match rates of sodium intake with rates of sodium excretion in an attempt to go back to balance. However, again, this doesn't happen immediately. It takes about three to five days. So the first day, the kidneys are going to still way behind and they're going to start excreting three and a half grams of sodium. So at the end of the day, uh, at the end of this first day, the, the body loses two grams of sodium. So if you start at 64 grams of total body sodium, now you're down to 62. Day number two, you start at 62 grams of total body sodium, you're still eating one and a half gram sodium diet and your kidneys are start to decrease the amount of sodium excretion in an attempt to match the intake so they go down from 3.5 to 2.5 but at the end of that day you're still losing one gram of sodium from your body so you're down to 61 grams day number three you start at 61 grams you're eating 1.5 grams of sodium per day your kidneys are still trying to adapt and match the intake uh, and they go down to two grams of sodium per day excretion, uh, but at the end of that day, you're still losing half a gram of sodium, so your total body sodium goes down to 60.5. And finally, at day number four, your kidneys are able to match the intake with excretion, 1.5 sodium in, 1.5 sodium out, that day you don't gain any sodium, and you remain at 60.5 grams, your body is go back into sodium balance. Now. If you look at what happened in the uh, course of four days, <clears throat> you your body lost three and a half grams of sodium, okay? So if we go back to uh, the inferior portion of the slides and look at the boxes again, total body sodium and total body water, uh, you know, maintaining a normal proportion, as we mentioned before, uh, but now your total body water remains the same, but your total body sodium has decreased since you have lost sodium by and going into the low sodium diet so now the proportion the normal proportion is lost uh, and you have less total body sodium than water this is going to cause a decrease in plasma sodium concentration decrease in plasma osmolality and decrease in plasma tonicity now your body doesn't like this so the body always tries to maintain normal sodium concentration in the plasma, normal osmolarity, normal tonicity. So what does your body do? Your body basically gets rid of that uh, section of water uh, in an attempt to match again the, the total body sodium. And at the end of the day, you your body actually have achieved that and have decreased the amount of total body water. And now the total body sodium and total body water are again back to normal proportion, 140 milliequivalents of sodium per one liter of water, but at the expense of having lost that red area on the top that is uh, salt and water that is basically isotonic fluid that your body has lost. That actually is going to mm, cause an, a contraction of the extracellular fluid volume. And this applies to people who go into like uh, low calorie diets. As you know, if you ever go into a low calorie diet, um, you lose weight very quickly uh, in the first few days. Not because you have burned fat, but usually low calorie diets are also low sodium diets. So what you're losing the first few days is not fat, you know, it's actually just fluid. It's like a diuretic effect uh, because of this uh, phenomenon here. So when your total body sodium goes down, your extracellular fluid volume goes down. So by summarizing, what I explain is the basis for the what we call the sodium dogma. What is the sodium dogma? Is that total body sodium is the main determinant of extracellular fluid volume. So when your total body sodium goes up, your extracellular fluid volume goes up as well. And when your total body sodium goes down, your extracellular fluid volume will also go down. Now, how do we assess the state of total body sodium in your body? How can you tell if somebody has too much sodium or too little sodium? It's easy. Uh, we use the surrogate of total body sodium, which is extracellular fluid volume. So we clinically assess the state of extracellular fluid volume to determine what is the total body sodium. So you only need for that your history and physical. No tests are necessary. So if somebody comes with, um, you know, five kilograms weight gain, uh, dyspnea, JBD, crackles in the lungs, edema, by definition that person has 
total body sodium up because their extracellular fluid volume is expanded. If somebody comes to the emergency room with vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, tachycardia after eating a bad burrito, uh, that patient is hypovolemic, so by definition, the total body sodium is low. So you don't need any tests, just your history and physical to determine the state of total body sodium. Now, how does the body know that we are, uh, that our total body sodium is up or down? Do we have sodium sensors? Well, in general, we don't. But we have sensors that sense a surrogate for total body sodium, sensors that sense volume, okay? And these are called the baroreceptors. And we have different types of baroreceptors that are uh, um, displayed in this table. Uh, we have uh, the main ones are the high pressure or arterial baroreceptors that are located in the carotid bodies and aortic arc. <coughs> and basically they are going to uh, respond to changes in volume. So for instance, when the volume is down, uh, they will sense that and the sympathetic system will get activated and we know that sympathetic system is responsible for renin release and renin will trigger aldosterone release and that will uh, uh, retain salt in your kidneys uh, with expansion of the volume again. Uh, there are also baroreceptors that are uh, located uh, in the venoatrial junction, in the atrium, in the ventricles, in the pulmonary vessels. Those are called low pressure or cardiopulmonary baroreceptors and they will elicit a similar response, sympathetic activation followed by renin release when the volume is down. Uh, we also have baroreceptors in the kidneys, specifically located in the afferent arterial of the glomerulus and they will directly re release renin when the volume is down. Uh, now, we also have sensors that actually are not baroreceptors per se, but can sense sodium directly. And those are located in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and that is called the macula densa. Macula densa can sense sodium reductions directly, uh, and when that's the case, uh, then the macula densa will assume that the volume, the sodium is down, the volume is down, and will release renin into the circulation as well. So these are the, the way the body actually can sense changes in total body sodium, at least indirectly. Now, it's important to remember that the baroreceptor does not sense total extracellular fluid volume, okay? It senses only a small compartment. And in order to remember that, we'll review uh, body fluid compartments uh, again. So we know that we have certain amount of fluid in the body you know this is distributed in total body water okay and this total body water can be um, divided into the fluid that is inside the cell so the intracellular fluid which constitutes about two-thirds of total body water and the fluid that is outside the cells which is the extracellular fluid compartment which constitutes about a third of total body water now the extracellular fluid compartment is um, also um, can be divided into two compartments. The interstitial fluid compartment, which is three quarters of the extracellular fluid, which is, so it's the bigger compartment in the extracellular fluid. And the intravascular fluid compartment, which only constitutes about a quarter of the extracellular fluid compartment. Now, this doesn't stop here. The intravascular fluid compartment can also be divided into two compartments. A larger compartment, which is the volume of fluid or plasma that is located inside the veins, which constitutes about 85% of the intravascular fluid compartment, and the volume of plasma that is inside the arteries, which, each, which is only 15% of the intravascular fluid compartment. Turns out that the baroreceptor is going to be located only in this tiny compartment and it will sense changes in the volume of this compartment and nothing else. So the baroreceptors only care for the volume inside that compartment because that is the volume of blood that will perfuse tissues. So that's what the body cares about. Okay? It doesn't care about the volume of the interstitial fluid or what is inside the veins. It cares only about that tiny compartment. And you know, the name for that compartment is called the effective arterial blood volume. 
some people call it effective circulating volume, but do not say intravascular volume because that, that's wrong. The correct name is effective arterial blood volume or effective circulating volume. You know, the effective, the intravascular volume is a bigger compartment, so it's not that. So, the effective arterial blood volume is conceptualized as the volume of arterial blood that perfuses tissues. And that's why we need a sensor there to measure it because that's what we care about. When the tissues don't re receive enough blood, then we're in trouble. All right. It is sensed by the baroreceptors, but the problem is it's very difficult to measure, okay? It's almost impossible to measure. So we rely on surrogates, surrogate markers of, of the state of this compartment. We don't have a way to directly measure it. How can we indirectly assess the, the volume of this compartment? Well, if we said that when the, the volume is reduced and the baroreceptor sense that, and you eventually re release renin, which makes your kidneys to retain sodium, then one way to assess for this would be to assess the ability of the kidneys to retain sodium, which in the case of reduction of the effective arterial blood volume should be low. So when the urine sodium is low, which means that your kidneys are retaining sodium, that indirectly is telling you that this compartment is reduced. Another way to assess that is by measuring the fractional excretion of sodium or phena. When it's less than 1%, will tell you indirectly that this compartment is reduced. There are other ways to assess uh, the state of this compartment, and the kidneys also retain um, urea uh, when the volume is down. So if you measure fractional excretion of urea, that should be low, less than 35%. The kidneys also retain uric acid. So another way to um, um, measure uh, or assess this compartment is by measuring the fractional excretion of uric acid, which should be low as well, uh, less than 10%. So these are all indirect measurements or indirect ways to, to assess the state of the effective arterial blood volume. Now, uh, Effective arterial blood volume is uh, determined by uh, the volume of the stellar fluid volume, but at least there are other uh, clinical factors that are important and they also influence the effective arterial blood volume. So in order to have a normal effective arterial blood volume, you need three things. You need first a heart pump that will pump the blood forward towards the tissues you need also blood vessels that have a certain vascular tone or certain peripheral resistance. And of course, you need volume inside those vessels, blood inside those vessels, okay? All of these three factors will contribute to the perfusion of the tissues by this effective arterial blood volume, which as we know is sensed by the baroreceptors, okay? So what can cause reductions of the effective arterial blood volume? So, number one, as we know, you could have a normal heart pump, right? You could have a vessels with normal tone, with normal peripheral resistance, but the volume inside the vessels is reduced. And that will cause decreased effective blood volume. That is called low ECF volume or hypovolemia. So when the volume of the ECF compartment is decreased, then all the compartments that make the ECF will also be decreased. So the interstitial fluid will be decreased, the intravascular fluid will be decreased, the venous compartment will be decreased, and of course the uh, arterial compartment or effective arterial blood volume will also be decreased. Another mechanism for decreased effective arterial blood volume will be when your vessels are normal, they have a normal peripheral resistance or normal vascular tone, they have a normal amount of volume inside, but the heart pump is not working well. And therefore, that will cause decreased effective arterial blood volume as well. And that is called heart failure. And finally, you could have a person who have a normal heart pump, have a normal amount of blood volume inside the vessels, but the vascular tone is decrease, the vessels are dilated, and that will also cause decreased perfusion of the tissues, decreased effective arterial blood volume, and that's called vasodilation. One typical example of vasodilation is patients with cirrhosis, 
where there is a splachnic vasodilation with pooling of the blood there. All right. So what happens? How does the body respond to uh, a decrease in total body sodium, and therefore a decrease in ECF volume, and therefore a decrease in effective arterial blood volume? So when your ECF volume goes down, your effective arterial blood volume goes down and that will be sensed by the baroreceptors which will activate renin release and then subsequently aldosterone release so this is the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is activated which will make your kidneys to retain sodium why? because if you retain sodium total body sodium will go up and that means that your extracellular fluid volume will also go up so that's going to fix the problem. Now, it's important to, to note that when the effective arterial blood volume is severely decreased, more than 15%, then another hormonal pathway is going to be activated, and that is antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, also known as vasopressin, which will be released when the effective blood volume is reduced more than 15%. So when there is a mild decrease in effective blood volume, the RAS system is activated only. But when there is a severe reduction in the effective arterial blood volume, both the RAS system and the ADH system are both activated. All right? Uh, now, it's important to remember, as we just mentioned, that hypovolemia or low ECF volume is not the only cause for decreased effective blood volume. We also have heart failure and vasodilation as two other potential mechanisms for decreased effective blood volume. However, the body will respond to this in the same way that this, the body responds to hypovolemia, by activating the RAS system, retaining salt, and increasing total body sodium, and therefore increasing extracellular fluid volume. Of course, in these conditions, heart failure or cirrhosis, most of the volume will be retained in the interstitial fluid. Not much is going to get into the effective arterial blood volume compartment. So it, it is not an adaptive response, it's a, a maladaptive response, and it's sort of like an illogical response because uh, you are retaining salt and increasing the volume when volume is not the problem. The problem is the heart pump or the problem is the tone of the vessels that, are, that, are, that is decreased. So these two conditions, heart failure and vasodilation, causing sodium retention are called irrational sodium retention states because again there is no rationality there's no logic to retain salt and increase the volume when volume is not the problem now in the case of the opposite case when the effective arterial blood volume is increased usually happens when your ECF volume is increased as well not because there is the pump is working much higher or the vessels are constricted uh, the effective arterial blood volume will be increased and that will be sensed by the baroreceptors, which will send signals to do the opposite, inactivate the RAS system, which will cause decrease in sodium retention by the kidneys, and therefore the total body sodium will go down. And then, therefore, if the total body sodium go goes down, then the volume of the ECF will go down as well. All right, so what are the take home points? Total body sodium is the main determinant of extracellular fluid volume. Hypovolemia and hypervolemia are sodium disorders. S disorders of sodium deficit, hypovolemia, and sodium excess, hypervolemia. The RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, is the main hormonal pathway responsible for so total body sodium homeostasis. And finally, a decrease in effective arterial blood volume can be caused by hypovolemia, but also can be caused by heart failure and vasodilation. Thank you for your attention.